tipping point, and oh, okay, that's not so bad, it's not a tipping point, and I think that's really, really far from reality. Um, I'm not going to be talking about tipping points in the climate system, which is what the two previous presentations were about. I'm talking more generally about just tipping points and local, local tipping points. Uh, so I have a new definition or a different definition for tipping point, and I have to have a look at it right here. So tipping point is a critical threshold at which uh, time perturbation can qualitatively alter the state or development of the system, often the sh shifting, shifting the system to an irreversible state. So it's this qualitative change. So when we're talking about a climate tipping, tipping point in the climate system is quite different than when you're just talking about a tipping point at the local scale. And so that's what I'll be fo focusing on today. Um, okay, so just you've seen some images like this. This is a picture of abrupt thaw. Um, going from a frozen to a thawed state is clearly a change in the qualitative state of the system. Um, and you can also see it's quite extreme in this case. Again, an another photo at the top of this hill slope in northeast Siberia. This is just a regular forest. Large ice wedges, massive ice in the system. The ice melts ground collapses, you're never going to go back to the original state when you see this As Gustav mentioned, there's not a single temperature threshold for permafrost thaw in the Arctic. So going from something like this to something like this, this is going to happen gradually. It's already happening in some places. Does it matter? Does it matter? Does that make it not? A tipping point or not relevant, I'd say, for the five million people who live in the Arctic, uh, it doesn't matter at all. Okay, so I just want to go to talk about some of the local impacts of permafrost thaw in the Arctic. By 2050, and there's an updated version of this paper but the, the, from this past year, but it's kind of similar patterns. At 1.5 degrees Celsius, about 3 million people uh, will be impacted by permafrost thaw. At 2 degrees Celsius, 3.6 million. Um, and 9 to 33% of people are in high hazard areas. Uh, significant impacts to infrastructure, so 70% of infrastructure in the northern region is in areas with high potential for thaw, 30% of infrastructure with high hazard areas, so a high hazard area is that abrupt ground collapse. 45% uh, of gas and oil fields in the Russian Arctic are in high hazard areas. Um, in Alaska alone, there are 73 communities, at least 73 communities, that are facing imminent threats from permafrost thaw, flooding, and erosion. About $5.5 billion um, economic impact. And, and there's zero, like given these, uh, the, the economic cost, the cultural cost, the human cost of these local tipping points, um, no countries currently have any a climate relocation governance framework to deal with this. And so regardless of the fact that this may not be a climate tipping point, um, there's some serious impacts that are happening now. So I just want to take a look at what some of these qualitative changes look like. Um, again, this is not a condition, it's a case of abrupt thaw where you see this like massive, you know, houses tumbling off the cliff. But I would say for the person living in the house, this is a qualitative change. So I would call this a tipping point because the house is starting to sink, um, the house is getting flooded. When the house gets flooded, you get mold on your walls and you have to move out. I would call that a tipping point. Uh, here's another case where this was a place where there was a boardwalk. Uh, these communities, many of the northern communities, uh, there there aren't often like roads as we think of them. They're boardwalks where you get around like by ATV. Um, this was a boardwalk. Now it looks like a river. Again, I would call that a qualitative change in the state. Um, here's another place. This was a location where someone who lived in this community told me they used to go berry picking. If you haven't been berry picking, you know you don't pick berries in a place that looks like this. You're usually on more upland, drier areas. Blueberries will not grow here. That's a qualitative change. I call that a tipping point, even though we're not seeing abrupt ground collapse. And then here's another one. I mean, this is, you know, this is quite typical for many northern areas. The only way in and out is by runway, 
and these runways are in very, very wet locations or they're adjacent to uh, a river, right? Because that's how you're getting your supplies in to build the runway. The river is eroding, exacerbated by permafrost. Again, uh, when communities have to move, that's a qualitative change and it's not going back. You can see the land in this picture starting to sink all around this runway. Um, and even at, at the local scale, there are self um, perpetuating processes that cause these, at these local scale processes of permafrost thaw for this to continue and for this to be amplified. So this is one, it's called Ustek. Ustek is a Yupik word that means catastrophic land collapse. And it describes the processes of permafrost thaw, erosion, and flooding, and how they interact to exacerbate e e the other one. So you get permafrost thaw, the ground collapses, it makes it more susceptible to flooding. When you have flooding, now you have water sitting on top of the ground. That water conducts heat into the ground, leading to more thaw. When you have ground thaw, the ground, this kind of cement, this solid cement, is now muck and that leads to erosion, erosion leads to more, more thaw. Um, Oystec recently, in the past couple years, was actually put in as a new hazard in the state of Alaska hazard assessment report, recognizing that these processes aren't happening alone, but these are happening in this broader context. Okay, and I'm just gonna end with some things that I think are policy needs, because, I, you know, I think what we're talking about a lot when we're thinking about permafrost thaw is we're thinking about mitigation and the, need, and, the, and the great need to address the additionality of permafrost thaw on our global carbon budgets and to take this into account. But at the same time, I think the mitigation needs are also really urgent because of we have this, these impacts that are happening on the ground. So on the policy needs here, I'm not talking about mitigation, which I do think those are greatly needed, but really in terms of adaptation, what do we need to do to respond to these local scale tipping points? So the first thing is a recognition of permafrost thaw and disaster response planning and support. And I'll speak uh, about the US, which is where I'm from, but I have a feeling this is um, in other countries as well. Things that people consider slow onset, like permafrost thaw and erosion, um, which in a person's lifetime are about that slow. Um, we have no mechanism for dealing with these. So in the US, we have FEMA, this deals with the hurricane. But if you get erosion happening and six months later your house falls off the cliff, you're out of luck because there's no, there's no policy right now to address this. Okay. Um, the second thing I think we need both in the U.S. and nationally is recognition of and support, financial support, to address the irreversible loss of indigenous lands as a result of permafrost thaw. Northern communities are often let out of, left out of the conversation about loss and damage. People are losing not just land and homes, uh, cultural resources and subsistence ways of living. And my third point um, is we, the international community in the U.S. and globally desperately need an adaptation governance framework to facilitate the responses to these local tipping points. I think we're spending much needed time on talking about mitigation, but right now, like the clock is ticking, that there are communities in the north and elsewhere who are dealing with this and having to make decisions about relocation, and there currently is just no, no plan in place to deal with it. So um, I'll end it there, that's all I have to say about local tipping points.